Jesus Bible and Current Events from a Christian Perspective, Battling Spiritual Wickedness in High Places, One Podcast at a Time. This is the High Places Podcast. Hello everyone, this is Jim. I wanted to talk about something today that I touched on really briefly, I think in uh, one or two episodes ago. And this whole story with uh, Israel Folau. He is a professional rugby player in Australia. Uh, he's one of, if not the best player uh, in their, uh, their uh, rugby league there. And I think he's on the Australian national team too. And he, he's a Christian man. He's a Pacific Islander. And uh, there's a strong Christian uh, heritage and culture. Uh, in that area and uh, among that uh, group of people. And so he, you know, texts uh, and, or uh, like, you know, tweets out uh, Bible verses and posts, things like that. And about, I guess it's been about a month or so ago now, he posted a quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. uh, And I'll read it real quick. Um, And this is one that... (laughs) Yeah, if anybody's going to get mad at a Bible verse, um, this is the one that the God-haters uh, really go after. But it's chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 9. And it says, uh, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, that's um, that phrase. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So that um, that verse it lists a lot of uh, different sins uh, that people do, uh, but the one that got him in trouble. And so I read this from the King James. Other translations use the word homosexual. And so that uh, um, abusers abusers of themselves with mankind. So that word in the Greek, and I'm going to butcher this, um, arsenokoites. And the definition of that is one who lies with a male as with a female, sodomite, homosexual. And that's uh, straight from uh, the Strong's Concordance. And so, and a lot of people, uh, just as an aside, a lot of people like to point out that the word uh, homosexual uh, wasn't in the Bible up until recently, recently being like the last century or so. And I think we covered this. But the word homosexual uh, was uh, created by a German academic in like the early 1800s. So obviously the King James Version uh, being translated uh, before the early 1800s, about 300 years before, uh, didn't use a word that hadn't been invented yet. Um, But so uh, Israel Flau used a translation that used the word homosexual. Um, And then effeminate is in there also, which is the... um, uh, without getting too graphic, the um, uh, submissive person in a homosexual relationship. And so this got him in no end of trouble. And he um, wouldn't recant because uh, he's just quoting the Bible. Uh, it had been interesting if um, he had, or anybody else, would have quoted the Quran. Um, But so Israel Flau got in so much trouble over this that they fired him. They kicked him out of the league. They kicked him off of the Australian national team as well. And so this is a guy that had, you know, a multi-year, multi-million dollar contract. Um, He's like the star player in the league. So imagine like Steph Curry getting kicked out of the NBA. Um, And that's what went on with this guy for quoting the Bible for quoting the Bible. I mean, that is um, amazing. And he also, in his um, original post, I guess it was on Instagram, um, the message 
uh, he, he got almost 70,000 likes on that, um, by the way. But he, he also added a message. He said, those that are living in sin will end up in hell unless you repent. Jesus Christ loves you and is giving you time to turn away from your sin and come to him. So it's, it's grace as well, a warning. And that's why he said he wasn't going to apologize for this because he didn't feel he was doing anything wrong by warning people. In fact, quite the opposite. He said that he was showing his love for people, which of course, if you warn somebody of the danger they're in, um, it's hard to, it's hard to say that you, you aren't being loving, but we live in such an upside down world right now. It's like giving heroin to a heroin addict. They will appreciate you doing that and they will think that it's a very loving thing to do, but you're not going to be helping them at all. You're going to be doing exactly the opposite. Uh, if you warn them that heroin will ruin them and kill them, uh, they're going to be pretty angry with you. Uh, but you would be telling them the truth. And it's funny because he went on uh, to quote another verse in Galatians. And uh, again, this verse lists a lot of uh, different sins also. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you, I tell you before, as I also told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He also had a quote from Acts chapter 2, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, it's, um, so he, he was doing what Christians are supposed to do, and God has given him a public stage because of the talents that he has, and he used that as he should. And they fired him. Um, it's, it's, it's just, um, it's amazing. And so I was lo looking at other commentaries in that and watching videos from Australian news, conservative news. And even the people that supported him, um, they supported him based on the idea of religious freedom. But I, I, I couldn't find one of them that actually agreed with his biblical position uh, on, on this. Um, and so, uh, it was, yeah, everybody thinks he did something wrong by quoting the Bible. The only difference between, uh, the people that wanted him fired or did fire him and the people that didn't think he should be fired was the issue of, you know, religious freedom and freedom of speech. Um, and so it's amazing uh, and, you know, people are, are calling for a boycott of Rugby Australia and a boycott of Qantas, because Qantas, the airline, sponsors uh, Rugby Australia. Um, and, yeah, and so, I mean, that gets into this whole uh, issue with these big companies now. This is such a weird thing, because, you know, for decades... Um, uh, Republicans in this country, it's, it's a, just a weird mix. So you've got a lot of uh, evangelical Christians vote Republican, um, and Republicans are seen as pro-business. And yet, uh, look at these big uh, tech companies, for example. Uh, they support um, the Democrats, and, and not just, you know, the Democrats, but this sort of Marxist ideolo ideology that's being pushed these days. And uh, because I guess, you know, just like politicians want to be totalitarians, businesses like the idea of being totalitarian as well, because it's basically an acceptable way to have a monopoly. Um, and so if, if you're on the side of the totalitarian politicians, how can they deny you the same sort of control in an economic sense? But see, that's the thing. 
you listen to these politicians and they're talking about, you know, breaking up Facebook. Um, they're talking about these uh, huge tax increases on corporations and rich people. And yet it's these like big tech companies that are giving all this money to these Marxists. Um, and it's still, it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, um, the companies still support these Marxists. But then on the other hand, you know, the Republicans who are supposed to be, you know, these pro-business uh, people, well, they're supporting businesses who are attacking Christian values and, and thereby attacking the Republicans, uh, one of the Republicans' largest constituencies, evangelical Christians. Uh, and uh, you'd think the Republicans would have saw in 2012 uh, what happens. Uh, when you try to run someone for president who the evangelical Christians don't support. Uh, and yet, look at these businesses um, in all sorts of industries that are promoting um, all this homosexual stuff. Even Walmart, even Walmart's like, come on, don't you even know who your customers are? Um, I mean, even they're pushing this stuff. And I mean, it's just over and over again. This is, oh, Since when did businesses become like, social activists uh, what does that have to do with running a business you'd you'd think a company would just want to there used to be a time where companies didn't want to get involved in politics because they didn't want to offend um part of their market um and if you're going to take a political position there are obviously opponents to that position and so why would you want to chase away customers um, part of the problem is, as we've talked about before, uh, Christians still go out and give money to these companies that um, actively work against their values and discriminate against Christians. Um, I mean, look at these big tech companies. Look at these entertainment companies. They, they vilify Christians, try to make Christians look stupid uh, and hateful and bigoted. Um, and try to make God look that way. And yet Christians fork over a lot of money to these people so that they can keep attacking them. That's like giving bullets to someone who's shooting at you. <laughs> um, yet that's what goes on. And so um, these companies feel that they can do this thing with impunity. Um, and so they can just keep attacking Christians. And this, we've talked about this before, this LGBT stuff. This is the weapon of choice. This is the weapon of choice. And here again, here again, it has been used against a high profile guy. The guy's only 30 years old. He's at the, you know, he's hitting the peak of his career. And it's pretty much over now. Uh, unless he goes to another country. He's literally, if he wants to make a living doing what he does, he's being chased out of the country. Uh, I mean, it's extraordinary. And, you you know, uh, everybody's heard the stories about, you know, bakers, photographers, florists. Um, in the state of Washington, if you own a pharmacy, you are required by law to carry abortion pills. You are required by law. A pharmacy in Washington state got in trouble for not having them in stock. And when someone came in and wanted them, they directed the the person to a dozen other pharmacies within a five mile radius where they could get them like, like literally five or 10 minutes away. And that wasn't sufficient because you should be able to kill your child as conveniently as possible. And so the Washington state attorney general uh, went after this pharmacy and the pharmacy lost. So can you imagine that? Um, the government is going to tell a private business what products they have to stock on their shelves. That's extraordinary. Um, and so this is the weapon of choice. And I heard uh, someone was commenting on this, and I think uh, I, I was going to say I thought he wrote for the New York Times at one point, but don't quote me on that. He's a conservative guy. And... Um, uh, he talked about, uh, he was doing interviews about this whole thing because he talks about the United States being a, a post-Christian country. And I think that's um, clearly evident. Uh, we're, uh, just look at uh, Western Europe 
and that's where we're going to be in, you know, five or ten years. And, and Western Europe is certainly post-Christian, uh, if not out-and-out anti-Christian. Um, and he was just ta- someone asked him, you know, how did all this start? And how has this uh, LGBT stuff, you know, gotten this far this quickly? And he, he commented on that. He's like, yeah, you know, because um, at first it was just, it was tolerance. And then it was um, civil unions. I remember when the whole debate about civil unions was going on in the 90s. And the gay folks said, uh, yeah, we don't want marriage. That's just for you straight people. We want, you know, civil unions. And they were given civil unions. And then they wanted marriage. And uh, I remember uh, reading some activist, um, LGBT activist, talking about this. And they said, yeah, we, we wanted the whole thing. But you do it one step at a time. You do it incrementally. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts. Um, but the comment was on how did you go so quickly from gay marriage, the ruling by the Supreme Court a number of years ago, to this transvestism and these kids, I mean, literally kids under 10, you know, talking about, you know, transgender this and that and these drag kids that we've talked about before. How has this happened so quickly? And this guy said, well, it started with the sexual revolution in the 1960s. And I hadn't, I had, I guess I hadn't heard anybody comment on that before and put that together. But his point was that as soon as you started to um, propagate this mentality, the whole, if it feels good, do it. And so whatever brings a person their own personal satisfaction, uh, then that should be allowed. And of course, that, that's the exact antithesis of Christianity. Um, we're supposed to repent from the evil things that our flesh desires. Um, and so that is when Christianity really became the enemy because it was a direct confrontation uh, to where the culture was going. And so now uh, uh, Christianity still stands in the way because when uh, guys like this Falau just quote from the Bible, people are reminded what the Bible says and God gave people a conscience and they know this stuff is wrong and they spend so much time trying to numb their conscience so that they don't feel anything anymore so they don't feel guilt for their sins, that when they're confronted with God's word, the, sh- the sword of the Spirit, uh, it cuts, uh, it's sharp, uh, and they notice it, and they're reminded of God, and they have to face uh, God again, uh, whether they want to or not. And so they attack. It's, it's, a, it's a cornered, they're like a cornered animal, and they just attack. So this is the vehicle. Um, all this sexuality stuff, you know, we've already had the fornication and the adultery and all this has been going on for decades. And, and now we're at this, uh, this point with this LGBT stuff. And again, Romans one, this stuff is just picking up speed and you could see that. And I guess I would go all the way back to, uh, when you had no fault divorce introduced divorce used to have such a huge stigma attached to it. You know, you wouldn't date somebody who had been divorced. You certainly wouldn't marry somebody because the Bible says not to. Jesus says not to more than once. But that was kind of the first uh, arrow in the assault. Um, And it seemed, you know, not uh, today. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal at all. A look at how pervasive divorce is in the church, small c. Uh, And... um, and you, and so uh, people don't even think about that as an issue anymore. Uh, you'll you won't hear a sermon about that in a church these days. Um, but it just kind of picked up, and then you had the sexual revolution, the heterosexual fornication, then homosexual, and now you have transgender, and all of this stuff faster, faster, more and more. And this is the weapon because this is the thing that kind of got it started uh, from a cultural standpoint. Obviously, people have been committing these sins for thousands of years. Um, But as far as Western culture 
accepting this, not only accepting this kind of behavior, um, but this whole mentality of whatever feels good to me, I should be allowed to do it. And so that, that expands to anger, to pride, to materialism, um, all things that um, God says are wrong. And so this puts the culture and Christianity in direct confrontation. And so the guy that was talking about this uh, mentioned, uh, and he, he actually looked at Jewish communities and, you know, how did the Jews as a people, after being dispersed, scattered all over the world, all of the hardship and persecution they went through, how did they still retain their identity and their culture? And it's because um, they had very close-knit communities uh, and they kept up the traditions of, of their religion. And so his, um, his whole angle is that um, Christians need to do the same. Uh, Christians need to, um, you know, reinforce their relationships with one another, reinforce that Christian community. This is why church is important. Uh, the Bible says that we should be going to church, uh, that, we, that we shouldn't neglect the assembling of ourselves together, um, to worship God, to praise God, to learn about God, and to exercise our spiritual gifts to help our Christian brothers and sisters. Um, and so more and more, this is going to be important as the culture really goes after and attacks Christians in an overt way. And you are seeing that in Western society. And so all that means is that we are finally going to get a taste of what other Christian communities have dealt with for 2,000 years, as we've discussed before. Um, but right now, is when the choice needs to be made. Are people who call themselves Christians going to continue to embrace this culture that hates them and hates God, hates Jesus, the Savior who saved them from hell? Are people going to continue to embrace the enemy, the enemy of God? Are they going to give them money? Are they going to spend their time with them? Are they going to try to imitate this wicked culture? Are they going to let this culture indoctrinate them? Uh, put stuff into their head that trivializes sin? I mean, you have grown men dressing up as women. You have little children who are being um, told that um, being transgendered is natural and okay. In fact, you can probably get famous uh, for doing it. I, I mean, really, uh, how, uh, how much has sin been trivialized when this can happen in the open in a country that still has 70% of people that claim they're Christians? Obviously, that number is not true because um, uh, in a country with that many Christians, there is no way this can be uh, tolerated and trivialized, but uh, you have people um, who claim to be Christians who embrace this culture and who go right along with trivializing sin because they're willing to trivialize sin in exchange for what the culture has to offer, whether it's entertainment, whether it's a high-paying job, uh, whether it's, you know, achieving your, you know, personal or professional goals, whatever it is. Christians don't feel like outsiders yet. But there's uh, a point coming very, very soon where uh, Christians are going to have to decide that. And they are going to have something to lose, just like this uh, Israel Falau. Um, he had a four-year, $4 million contract. Um, I don't know about you, but, it, um, I will probably never stand to lose that much money. Um, so we have even less to lose from a material standpoint. Um, and yet people who call themselves Christians when confronted, uh, will choose this world. They will choose to go along with trivializing sin and basically saying that standing up for God and his holiness isn't as important as the money I can make at my job or whatever, uh, you know, worldly thing uh, people are attached to, uh, their, their favorite TV show or their, you know, 
favorite sports league or whatever. And people are going to decide. And the Bible talks about, uh, you know, separating the wheat from the chaff. And that's when it's going to happen. But boy, this, um, this thing with uh, this guy, so good for him that uh, what a great faith that God has given him and what great courage uh, that God has given him to stand up uh, to all this, despite all that uh, he's having to lose. Uh, what a, you know, that is a great test of faith and it's a great testimony that God has given him. And it's having an impact. People notice this stuff. And uh, if nothing else, um, it should strengthen all true believers uh, that no matter how much we have to lose, um, we've gained eternity. We can lose the whole world uh, because we've gained our soul through what Jesus did for us. Um, and God will give us the strength to stand up uh, against these things. And the things the world has to offer aren't that big of a deal anyway. When we get to heaven, we're not even going to think about those, <laughs> those things, the things from this life. So why are we holding on so tightly to them now? Just let them go and stand up for God and let the world have what it's going to have. Um, and uh, it, it's better, I, I think it's going to be better to be a faithful servant of God and have a strong testimony uh, and glorify God by doing that through the strength that His Spirit gives us than uh, you know to work for the right company and make the right money and, you know, Go see the same movie that all these other people are doing so you can talk about it. And, you know, I mean, all this stuff. Um, yeah. So there's going to be decision points. Um, praise God that he, uh, he helped this guy uh, make a good decision. And so I pray that he gives the rest of us strength. I pray that he gives the rest of us opportunities uh, to stand up uh, against this stuff and proudly, boldly, proclaim the glory of our God and his holiness and the salvation that he gives us uh, to wipe away our sins and to free us from the bondage of sin so that we uh, don't need these sins and aren't so desperate to hold on to them uh, that we're willing to trivialize them like the world does. Anyway, just wanted to cover that. This uh, this story has been interesting uh, to me, and I would encourage you to find out more about this guy. Um, but there's a whole lot going on, and I think it's um, very timely. And uh, depending on how <laughs> politics and leadership and whatever else goes in this country uh, and business, um, uh, I think uh, true Bible-believing Christians are going to be dealing with this much, much sooner than they ever thought. Uh, so, but that's okay. God will strengthen us. All right. That's going to do it. Take care, everyone. God bless. Stay strong. Pray. Stay in the word and be faithful. <laughs>